Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, myself, Dr. Sandeep Tripathi. And uh, <clears throat> today I'm very delighted uh, to have uh, Professor Saran Singh. So it's uh, personally, it's a very uh, privileged moment for me uh, to have you, uh, Professor Saran Singh, here uh, for today's uh, uh, lecture, uh, India's uh, Evaluating Foreign Policies uh, in uh, no, uh, Changing uh, Global Landscape. And especially Professor uh, Swan Singh will be highlighting uh, the Indo-Pacific you know, Indo perspective of India's foreign policy. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm so delighted uh, to welcome you, sir, here uh, on behalf of the Forum for Global Studies. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to extend uh, to uh, uh, Professor Kaisio uh, Jen also here, who is hosting this program, and uh, Professor, uh, Mr. Don McLean Hill as a moderator of this program. Uh, and, uh, and other, uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor Anpam Sarma is there, she is the head of department uh, <clears throat> from uh, Indira Gandhi Tribe University MP. And other, my colleagues, uh, Professor, uh, Mr. Pribil Maurya, Mr. Sivarayan, and other, my you know, students also here. So let me introduce uh, today's uh, special guest, Professor uh, Shwan Singh. Uh, Professor Shwan Singh is the finest voice of India's foreign policy across the country. And uh, we are so privileged that uh, FGS platform uh, to have you sir, here. And uh, 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 in DDDUs, uh, in international forum, and uh, in, in recently India's you know, uh, indo pacific you know, voice. Uh, so Professor Singh has been a very, very uh, articulate on this topic. And uh, so he has uh, been professor uh, as well as the chair at the Center for International Politics Organization at the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. So, uh, as well as uh, he is also president uh, at uh, Association, Association of Asia Scholars. And uh, uh, so many organizations uh, concerning foreign affairs and on policy. So uh, I'm sure that today's lecture is going to be very, very insightful for all policy makers, for practitioners, for students uh, in international relations and foreign policies, and of course, for us FGS Forum for Global Studies. So thank you so much. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a proud moment for us uh, to have you here. Uh, now, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, my dear friend, Don McLean Gill, to take the floor and moderate the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandeep. And we are truly honored, uh, I can't express this enough, uh, to have Professor Swaran Singh accept our humble invitation for today's special talk. Uh, I continue, of course, to be inspired and motivated by the comprehensive and concise discussions and talks of Professor Singh, the way he delivers it in the news and global academic events. And I am truly privileged to have the chance to virtually meet you again, sir. Now, the overarching theme of the series will revolve around the evaluation of India's foreign policy amid the evolving global landscape. Now, Professor Swaran Singh will be discussing a very crucial topic today, particularly on India's engagement in the Indian Ocean. Now, for the participants, please feel free to send your questions on the chat box or to me personally. Uh, on that note, uh, I wish to invite uh, Professor Swaran Singh on the virtual floor. And sir, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, I love to call you Dawn, uh, Dawn McLean Gill. Uh, thank you also to uh, Dr. Sandeep uh, Trivedi and uh, Professor Kesio Eduardo Zen uh, and the entire team of uh, Forum for Global Studies uh, to organize this uh, three-day uh, interaction focusing on India's uh, foreign policy in general. And so that's a great favor that uh, you're doing uh, to people like me and to India to uh, ensure that uh, we are all uh, up to date as far as what are the new challenges, what are the new contours uh, of evolving India's uh, both policies and perceptions. And I understand you have uh, had two lectures uh, focusing one on Europe yesterday and day before was of course on overarching theme of uh, globalization. How is that impacting on India's foreign policy? Uh, I'm asked to today focus on the emerging new area called the Indo-Pacific, which India looks at it from very Indian ocean-centric perspective because it is seen for India as an extension of India's engagement uh, with the Indian Ocean. 
And therefore, let us uh, spend maybe next 30, 40 minutes and I look forward to your comments and questions later in, in case uh, you wish to either uh, suggest something to me or ask me something. I'll try to respond to those uh, uh, perhaps with a greater comfort uh, knowing that some of you are interested in those issues. But let me make an initial exposition uh, of how India is looking at this whole issue of uh, Indo-Pacific geopolitical narratives, strategies, outlooks, perceptions, you know, different nations are issuing their own documents. Uh, ASEAN talks about an outlook, United States talk of strategy. So different countries have uh, sort of coined different uh, uh, metaphors. Uh, and to me, that again is very significant. because That again reflects the semantics, reflect the thinking. And we all today believe that perhaps the gravitational point of global geopolitics has uh, gradually drifted from North Atlantic to, uh, to begin with Asia Pacific and now to the Indo Pacific. And that the driving force uh, for this uh, change. I request you to please uh, switch off your mic. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, the global shift is happening to me primarily uh, because of. Uh, economic resurgence or economic growth rates being far more faster in the Indo-Pacific littoral that uh, makes it vibrant, may, makes it attractive uh, for uh, all developed nations uh, to engage. And then, of course, by extension, the fact that economic rise of China was unprecedented and the fact that it is gradually evolving into economic leverages being used for seeking political influence, uh, pushing military modernization, is how these growth rates also you know, develop into certain geopolitical implications, which makes again the major pass. Uh, look at Indo-Pacific, uh, not purely in terms of economic engagement, but also uh, recreating, reviving, uh, revamping in the security architectures uh, in the region. So basically the first point I'm making is that uh, Indo-Pacific region is a region of global uh, interest in that sense. And India is only one country, which again, uh, is uh, uh, obviously showing certain amount of interest and engagement in, in the Indo-Pacific region. That's a, uh, the first point. Now, let me come and talk about India uh, in specific. Uh, so, all of us know that uh, India's traditions of seafaring, uh, maritime adventures uh, or explorations, uh, Go back to ancient times. In fact, when Xi Jinping came to uh, a, a South Indian city called, called Mahavallipuram for a second informal summit uh, near Chennai in October of 2019, this was uh, the highlight that how even in 3rd and 4th century BC, there were connections, maritime connections between various Indian ports of that time and of course the Chinese ports of that time. So maritime activity goes back even to before Christ's period as to how some of these societies, kingdoms, uh, empires had uh, been seeking out uh, and then encountering other societies and other civilizations. And I think point that I must underline and all of you are very familiar with that point is that at that moment, you would remember that trade would happen only in terms of not volumes, but in terms of value. Only precious quantities could be taken far and wide to other countries and there were other elites who would be willing to buy these very, very exquisite, unique, you know, value-laden uh, or beautiful uh, art artifacts so from faraway countries, artisans. So trade was not at that time in terms of volumes. So because we were focusing much on value-laden trade at that time, which showed the uniqueness of a particular society to the other particular society, it had a direct implication for cultural connections because artifacts reflect our culture, our level of development, our understanding of what is significant for us. So trade in that sense was closely connected to cultural linkages. So it was not so much commercially driven, but culturally driven engagement uh, that India uh, had during that time, and all of you know the influence that, uh, for example, Buddhism had uh, from India, and you would remember the Kalinga War, uh, 3rd century BC, and the uh, King Ashoka sending missions of Buddhism to various uh, countries in the region, 
so buddhism and hinduism uh, in those uh, centuries defines uh, please allow me to say without uh, sounding pompous indianization of some of these uh, societies in larger uh, what we today call southeast asian region and then we move for uh, much uh, ahead very quickly so from 4th to 9th century for example pallavas the dynasty uh, was known for having built long term strong regular commercial and cultural linkages with all these uh, countries in the region followed from there from 9th to 13th century we had a very powerful navy chola navy chola dynasty in south of india uh, had a very powerful navy and in fact there are stories of chola uh, one particular king king rajendra in uh, 1025 actually invading sri vijaya sri vijaya is where now indonesia is that that was the another big empire in that region so uh, that was the only instance where maritime power had a coercive nature for whole millennia in that sense the only link that we had with entire this region at that time which laid the foundations and contributed to the blending of indian influences in in this entire region that we today call east asia or southeast asia uh, was very strongly in the roots of these societies and that is where the enormous level of comfort when you revive and re recall those connections that india had over a period of time uh, india's spice trade at some stage became very very significant but i'm particularly alluding to spice trade because that is what brought europeans the colonizers into india through the seas and of course india's connectivity over period of time declined with these regions then it became a direct correlation between european imperial power versus the colonies uh, in, in terms of silos rather than engaging with each other so different european countries came to colonize in various uh, countries in southeast asia and east asia uh, they likewise came and colonized uh, south asia and in uh, and, and indian some subcontinent at that time had many different kingdoms principalities uh, which were sort of uh, also occupied physically by uh, imperial uh, powers uh, we had dutch we had french we had portuguese we had british but ultimately british uh, you know they sort of made sure they pushed everybody out so what i'm underlining is that first millennia underlines a very strong relationship that uh, in this entire region that we today talk of uh, not indo pacific because we don't want to go all the way to uh, the island states uh, uh, even though some influence one can see even in those island states also uh, but definitely first millennia showcases a very strong link between india using monsoons you know that was the only way you could sail far and wide and therefore india today even talks of a monsoon project so in that sense uh, uh, this is again reviving the ancient time so in the second millennia of course relationships were not as uh, strong and wide and then of course let's jump very quickly fast forward to india becoming independence independent uh, getting preoccupied for first initial 3 4 decades with the uh, western neighbor because they had a very very uh, the ground you know it's called very very i'm not i'm avoiding to say destructive so i'm trying to say game changing uh, partition that we faced and therefore foreign policy became far too focused on west and then of course after the initial euphoria of uh, brotherhood with the northern neighbor china we got to another uh, tense uh, relationship with the large country china which took over tibet and became land uh, the border uh, within had a land border with india then which is disputed of course and that pushed india into uh, focusing much more on north and west and independent india though if you read books by nehru for example discovery of india uh, you see he is fully conscious of india's linkages with uh, this entire larger region in east of india uh, but preoccupation of foreign policy for first four decades i think or five decades continues to be on north and west and it is only in 1990s when again a lot of earth shaking events happen the collapse of soviet union end of uh, the cold war era india opening and reforming its economy at end of that decade india would also detonate uh, five nuclear tests 1990 is again a game changing period both for india internally and for the world externally because india internally not only 
opened up for economic reforms and had a test at end of the decade. But India also saw this period clearly politics shifting from one party, one family, one individual rule in this country to coalitions becoming the norm. So we now had what we today call para diplomacy, which means the regional leaders would have enormous role or provinces have enormous role in conceptualizing and operationalizing foreign policy or national decisions. So we now had several regional leaders and regional parties that were coming and becoming part of national uh, coalitions. So the nature of foreign policy was bound to change here. That is where Narsimha Rao lays the foundations of what we today call look east policy. And credit partly for look east policy goes also to the flying, flying geese model of Japan of 1970s, where Japan's ODA and of course technology had created tiger economies in Southeast Asia. So both rates. Today we talk of China giving challenge to United States. In 70s, we were talking of Japan giving challenge to United States because Japan was suddenly rising as an economic power at that moment. And Japan was helping the Southeast Asian tiger economies to grow very, very rapidly in that sense. And that is how ASEAN, the coming together of ASEAN, which of course goes back to containing communism, but becomes also a facilitator of rapid economic reforms and engagement and trade and investments. Uh, so we have these tiger economies and therefore when India wants to open up and engage and being fed up partly with the you know, disappointments with the western neighbor and northern neighbor wants to look east now, primarily focusing on the core six ASEAN nations at the time, but for economic engagement. But you remember at the same time, ASEAN itself is also completely metamorphizing, transforming. ASEAN 6 from 1990s not only begins to have a whole range of ASEAN centric forums to begin with, for example, ASEAN regional forum, and then of course all the way in 2005 East Asia summit, ASEAN becomes extremely active in redefining the post-Cold War alignments in the region because it's no longer, no longer Soviet Union and United States. China, meanwhile, 1990s is emerging as a very, very powerful economy. So ASEAN takes that great opportunity and becomes the center of gravitation of all the dialogues that are happening and, and becomes the focus of all regional parts to engage ASEAN and even faraway countries like Chile, for example, engages in ASEAN Regional Forum. So in that sense, ASEAN becomes very, very active. And that very active and tiger economies driven ASEAN is where India wants to engage now, very clearly. And India wants to engage them primarily on economic terms. But as I said, this is also a decade where super active tiger economies of ASEAN are also transforming. ASEAN becomes 10 member association from 6 to 10. So from archipelagic focus to continental focus, and this brings ASEAN to the borders of India. India now shares land borders with ASEAN. So ASEAN is not something which is uh, one has to sort of leap over a certain region to engage uh, ASEAN countries. But now ASEAN countries are land and maritime neighbors of India. And that gives a new spin because now the new four countries which are added, and incidentally, three of them are called Indochina, which also means that I mentioned of first millennia and India's engagement and influence and the blending with all these societies there. I should also underline that most of these societies, historians believe, actually came from south of China area. In 2500 to 1500 BC, when Homo sapiens were kind of moving around the world, the movement of populations happened in the direction from China's southeast, which means from north to south, which is Southeast Asia, and India from here, from west to east. That is why some region is today called Indochina, which is a buffer zone where Indic and scenic civilizations and cultures were blending now. They were mixing here. And Indochina, obviously all of you know, are Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and, and Myanmar. Now, what is unique here is not only these are countries that make ASEAN have land borders with India and maritime borders with India. These are also countries which perhaps become attractive in terms of India's so-called appropriate technologies and limited uh, 
capacity to invest becomes attractive in these least developed nations. So India is becoming attractive to them. India may not be very attractive to Singapore, for example, for technology transfer, but India is definitely very attractive for Laos for technology transfer. In agriculture, in fertilizers, in all kinds of other IT industry, education. So India sees itself uh, as a country which is welcomed in these uh, countries for either trade or education or investments or people to people relations. And what India now begins to realize also is that by re-engaging with these land neighbors of India, Indochina and Myanmar, there is another enormous dividend that India can receive now, which is that we had inherited through peaceful transfer of power all the institutions, the mechanisms, the strategies of British imperialism which had made India's northeastern region feel unconnected to mainland India. And there were so many insurgencies, so much of turmoil, violence, grievances. And though independent India was trying to engage with them very, very closely, and I have uh, done a certain amount of research of how the uh, father of India's nation, Mahatma Gandhi, had made enormous efforts to engage northeastern region with Indian National Congress. He had ensured that there were annual sessions that, that are conducted in, in Gauhati, that local leaders are encouraged to blend together with the Indian national movement. So it's not that indigenous leaders had not made efforts to reconnect, but to a large extent, British policies had guided how things were being looked upon from the official perspective and how we wanted to control those insurgencies there. Now here, what British had done specification campaigns in these you know, outlying areas where they thought uh, you know less civilized people live and therefore pacification was the approach, not engagement. And they had ensured that when the boundaries finish, these people should have nothing to do with their neighboring countries. So it is the disconnect which was emphasized in imperial history and that had further complicated problems for India in how to blend together and ensure peace and prosperity in India's northeastern region. Now when India begins to engage with the neighboring landed members, uh, land neighbors of ASEAN, and India sees itself becoming welcome, the old mindset of skepticism with these neighbors begins to dissipate. And India begins to explore how India's engagement with Indochina and Myanmar can actually contribute to India's assimilation of India's own Northeast. So Northeast becomes from buffer to a bridge in engaging ASEAN in this region. So that means that India's engagement with ASEAN becomes very deep-rooted, very focused, and very desired, valued, that India's engagement with ASEAN has multiple advantages for India, not just economics and trade. So you can now notice that India has gone as far as to you know, sign a contract uh, for refurbishing of Savan port and whole other ports in the region, for example. And Savang is an immediate example in this region, also some arrangement with the, uh, the port in Singapore. So we moved all the way this far that we are also now able to utilize that increased mutual confidence in taking what some people could describe it as strategic initiatives. So what I'm underlining here is that India's outlook to Indo-Pacific may look new, but it's very deeply rooted in India's civilizational traditions, India's engagement with ASEAN since early 1990s, and India's engagement with Indian Ocean. So those are the foundations from where you see India catapulting itself or being catapulted uh, into engaging the larger new geopolitical frame emerging today called the Indo-Pacific region. And like many major players in the region, India's focus, to some extent, I would not deny, remains also on how to understand and address, or to some extent tackle, the unusual impact of unprecedented rise of China in the larger Indo-Pacific region. So that India is able to ensure that the 
norms, rule of law, international law, fair play, the way they have been understood and built over uh, decades, are not pushed aside with a new frame, China-centric or let me say China-dominated order, where some of the other countries, including India, might find uh, things which are unfathomable. For example, China uh, defying the arbitration of permanent court of arbitration in 2016 uh, surprises most other countries, including India. How can we make sure that either we engage China or we congate China in a fashion uh, that certain amount of civility in behaviors is ensured uh, or consensus is built as to what is that basic minimum uh, conditions of a good behavior? Uh, not one country redefine, redefines what are the new norms uh, of behavior. So China definitely, in fact, let me say, because China is the largest economy in this uh, whole region, China has grown fastest in the whole region. China today, after end of uh, last uh, last year of pandemic 2020, has declared that they, they have crossed 100 trillion yuan economy, 100 trillion yuan economy. In current dollar terms, it's about $16 trillion, which is also very impressive. The second largest economy in the region is India, $2.7 trillion. So one understands that China is the big uh, big dragon in, in, in that region in that sense, and it has that leverage which it can use to make itself very attractive. And we have noticed several neighboring countries, uh, and this is extended neighborhood of China. Australian experts often talk about how South China is the hub of their imagination of Indo-Pacific. And if the hub of Indo-Pacific is transforming completely with artificial islands being built by Chinese and uh, some other countries being a sort of, uh, it may be harsh word to say, bullied uh, by Chinese uh, wolf warriors in that sense. Uh, so to some extent, that something that concerns India very clearly and guides India's approach to how one can ensure what India wants to see is India says free, open and prosperous in the Pacific region. So this is the immediate extended region of China which has seen one country after another lining up for the Belt and Road Initiative. I'm told there is a, a rapid rail project in Laos that China is building currently. And that single project is equal to 40 to 40 percent of the GDP of Laos. So you can imagine the kind of uh, the transformation that can happen in a country which is going to receive one project, uh, which is a 40 to 45 percent of its total GDP. And several other countries, Vietnam, everyone, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Thailand, all these countries are, it's very interesting to see that they are receiving, uh, they are becoming part and parcel of a Belt and Road Initiative, and that partly explains why ASEAN has never been able to stand as one. Four of the ten members of ASEAN have clash of claims on South China Sea with China, but we don't see any any you know singular one voice coming from ASEAN, and China successfully is able to deal with these issues on bilateral basis. They do have some kind of code of conduct created two to three times as different sets of these, but. They are they're very, very normative and it's more like talking shops rather than really being impactful on the ground. So China's rise has transformed this, this region in that sense and is transforming this region as well. And that is what concerns the, uh, the status quo powers in that sense. United States was the status quo power in this region and Harvard Spokes was the strategy of United States having military presence in uh, Korea, in Japan, in Singapore, in Philippines, in Australia. Uh, and that was the basis of military alliances being the guarantor of something that undergirded the security architecture in the region. Now focus is shifting. It is economic engagement. China is doing the same thing through economic engagement, that it expands economic engagement. Very often those countries which are recipient of these huge projects are not able to repay then they are, they are supposed to lease these uh, facilities. And China basically begins to, uh, you know, the debate on Australia, for example, how uh, several Australians uh, felt that China was uh, beginning to wield political influence, how Canberra, uh, you know, the legislators were discussing in the parliament. 
so political influence was uh, palpable in that sense and that led to certain reaction from the australian side then of course on the chinese side and that ping pong ball is still constantly popping on one side or on the other so there is a sense of indo pacific becoming an area of uh, interest to the so called status quo powers uh, uh, united states is is uh, the leader among them and they have taken several initiatives here to make sure they can ensure a certain amount of restraint on china to socialize china co-opt china uh, or even some of them think counter china so uh, i understand that in each of these countries there is a enormous variance of perception and policies they come together they stand together very often they do have some common shared understandings on what are the challenges in indo pacific but you scratch the surface and you know recently for example aukus australia uk us which came up suddenly and uh, you saw very harsh reaction strong reaction not harsh reaction from france with drawing the messages from united states and australia partly because they were losing a huge contract for the diesel submarines and now us is promising to supply nuclear submarines and even transfer technology so there was a both economic hurt technology transfer hurt and of course hurt that a close nato ally was not even know of what was happening so one can notice that there are different states and shades and now look at these three countries uk us and australia the moment prime minister scott morrison returned from united states on the recent visit where aukus was announced the first thing he said is aukus is not a military alliance whereas the whole world media was celebrating it as a military alliance or security alliance he also said china and is welcome to join in some of these initiatives in indo pacific so you understand there is a certain reluctance when when you notice that individual nations again begin to show variance and i'm putting all this on the table for you because i want to now underline how india stands at variance india is not bandwagoning any of these countries india is not just tiptoeing the line that maybe secretary of state mike pompeo pompeo would like to do you remember mike pompeo's speeches even during the quadrilateral security dialogue meetings and you should notice uh, the november <coughs> november or october last year meeting four foreign ministers they give individual speeches to the media when they brief the media and notice the enormous difference uh, from mike pompeo to indian uh, foreign minister at that time so they, there is enormous variance in how each of these wish to engage in the pacific region now that is the canvas i have painted for you to now come to very specifically india india goes to a very well known speech of prime minister narendra modi at shangri la dialogue in june of 2018 in singapore which laid out india's vision for indo pacific region and two things underlined that vision one prime minister clearly said we would not like to see this region militarized and india is very very wary of becoming part of any military alliance now that goes to india's post independence foreign policy india would not be part of any military alliances strategic autonomy is very significant for india's foreign policy independence of foreign policy is very significant for india's foreign policy so in that sense that is first point second india also said we would not like to see uh, indo pacific becoming a, a kind of a club of limited number of countries it should be inclusive and india after that constantly also talked of bringing russia and china into these narratives and negotiations indeed very soon next year in 2019 india insisted that in the annual maritime dialogue between china and india this issue of china engaging in the pacific be put on agenda so india was trying to ensure that its vision its commitment to ensuring indo pacific as, as inclusive is also demonstrated by inviting china to be a part and parcel of these narratives and discussions and strategies and things like that so these two fundamentally defined how india wanted to engage uh, the indo pacific region and that shows how after trying up to a certain extent and i gave example of uh, how the last presidency in united states and secretary of state my pompeo was pushing quadrilateral security dialogue into a certain kind of framework 
India must have uh, revealed or uh, showcased its reluctance uh, to be pushed around the, the way United States of that time would like quite to be moving in that direction. And that is why you see when they had the first quad leaders uh, online summit meeting on 16th of March uh, this year, three working groups that they created had nothing to do with China. They were three working groups on A, critical technologies, B, on climate change, and C, on uh, pandemic. And United States and India already are working together for a clean energy agenda 2050. India and United States are already working in production of vaccines that India is producing, and potentially US vaccines are also being produced in India. Raw materials being made available to India. So these are areas which had nothing to do with China directly, nothing to do with military alliance, uh, uh, kind of a uh, 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 nudging in, in that direction. And there was an understanding that Quad cannot become Asian NATO. You know, you remember the whole debate of whether Quad will be Asian NATO. This was put to rest in their first quadrilateral meeting. And that is what led to creation of AUKUS. Because if quadrilateral security dialogue cannot be pushed into becoming a potentially security alliance, then United States wanted to create a parallel security alliance. That is what led to AUKUS, which is going to play that role. So that means India is now very comfortable, assured, reassured that Quad is not going to play that role. There's another agency now, another alliance now, which is going to play that role. And Donald Trump, if you remember, had also revived something called Five Eyes, the, the intelligence agencies network of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, and US, five nations. So now we see there's an intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies network, there's a military alliance, then there is a general diplomatic engagement of a large canvas of dealing with issues now, in their last in-person summit, they've added many more new ideas. They've added cybersecurity to it. They've added maritime security to it. They're adding the, the 5G technologies to it. So you can imagine that over a period of time, the security dialogue is taking a shape which is much closer to the vision that India has. So India, therefore, is going to be operating in the Pacific region using this platform and will not join any other platforms which also coexist at the same time. And one also should notice how India over a period of time has expanded, not just at the larger level of Indo-Pacific, but also strengthened its immediate roots as to from where India jumps into Indo-Pacific region. So you can look at how in 2015, there was a motor vehicles agreement of BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Myanmar, and Nepal, so India is not just revamping the infrastructure building in India's northeast, but also connecting them to immediate neighboring countries on the eastern flank, which is Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and also other neighbors, Myanmar, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan. So, so that our bridge, which we will be using, which will be using in engaging the larger Indo-Pacific region is strengthened and consolidated and India goes and has an enduring engagement. Not that this bridge disrupts and engagement gets impacted. And very quickly, the last point is the shift from SARC, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, to BIMSEC, Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Cooperation, Technical and Economic Cooperation. So Bay of Bengal is the focus. Maritime is the focus. So you should notice how India has been able to push across its own terms, which it will apply while engaging the larger Indo-Pacific region, how India is constantly consolidating the whole region through which it will move towards its larger engagement with uh, Indo-Pacific region, India's uh, trilateral express way that goes all the way to Thailand, for example, uh, is interesting. So how this connectivity is being built right from where India is located on the land, 
also on oceans. Do you remember? In 2015 March, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had launched an initiative called Sagar, security and growth for all in the region. And that was reflected in how India provided pandemic assistance to all these littoral nations. Not just medicines, equipment, even food, several other things immediately. And that was part of Sagar vision. Now, extension of Sagar vision, you saw, is another very interesting. 2019, I think. Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative at the 14th meeting. Indian Prime Minister announced his vision of Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. And Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiatives, very interesting. You look at what is India's basic values that are guiding its engagement with Indo-Pacific and how India is able to ensure that it is not pushed down and, and made to do things it doesn't want to do. India's Indian Ocean, uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative focuses on three aims, wealth creation, welfare promotion, and promoting cooperative win-win strategies. These are three aims of India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. And it wants to make it very, very flexible. So it is not creating immediately an association and an organization and a secretariat and all that. No. The vision says any countries of the Pacific region would use this template of pushing and working together towards three aims, which is, as I just uh, mentioned to you, is very simply wealth creation, welfare promotion, and promoting cooperative win strategies. Any two, three, four countries could come together, focus on their niche advantages or niche strengths, and begin that initiative. Other countries could join and leave any time. So it's a very interesting vision that Prime Minister has proposed as to both how on, on continents, through land, through navigation, through land waters, through rails, through roads, but also through oceans how to constantly engage this littoral. And India's engagement in that sense with Indo-Pacific is very guided by India's engagement with Indian Ocean. India's experience with Indian Ocean littoral, India's engagement with Indian Ocean littoral. Now, this is an extension of the Sagar vision that Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative has been taken. And of course, in August this year, Prime Minister, when he addressed UN Security Council, for that month, India was holding the presidency of UN Security Council, he again talked of maritime security initiative. So India's engagement with Indo-Pacific is expanding, deepening, strengthening, but ensuring at the same time that India joins and engages this larger reason, region on its own terms, where it is at greater comfort, so that it can sustain that kind of engagement. And in that engagement, I would close by saying that uh, maybe many of you feel that the recent tensions between China and India have perhaps pushed India a little more closer to the United States. I want to deny that. I want to say I don't believe in this. That China making tensions on the border with India has pushed India around. India is too big. India is too old a civilization. India is too sensitive and too self uh, sort of, uh, self obsessed with uh, strategic autonomy, self-pride, independence, to be pushed around by any single factor. So therefore, I do not see that India's engagement in Indo-Pacific, uh, it takes note of China's rise, it takes note of what China is doing in that entire region, but the fact that China is pushing India into doing things uh, in a certain fashion, I am someone who, who, who cannot believe that this is how it is. And I've tried to narrate to you in about last 40, 45 minutes, how India is strengthening, deepening, widening its engagement from Lukis to Actis, with the larger Indo-Pacific region on its own terms. And that gives me certain confidence that India's engagement not only will be sustainable, but also perhaps will be impactful in the long run. And some of that, that is already visible on the ground, because I gave you an example of how India's reluctance to push quite into Asian NATO has resulted in AUKUS. So other countries have to look at other options if they want to do something different to what India feels at home with. 
and india would stay on its ground firmly and try to make its contribution in the larger in the pacific region let me stop here i hope i made some sense to my uh, participants in, in this uh, discussion and i look forward now to your comments or if you have any question that i'll try to respond to them thank you and back to don thank you so much professor shlan singh for that fantastic and of course comprehensive discussion on not only the the contemporary scenario but of course the historical trends taking place uh, between india and of course its geographical space uh, which it calls its neighborhood or extended neighborhood for that matter and uh, professor singh has of course uh, uh, comprehensively uh, discussed of course the change in geopolitical landscape uh, that is currently happening and how india configures uh, in this particular dynamic uh, and with that professor singh uh, i have received some questions that uh, uh, we would be happy to hear from you to answer uh, particularly on the points that you have raised uh, in this uh, fantastic uh, for the first question sir uh can the opus uh complement india's interest in the indo pacific thank you don i think it's very interesting question so much have been published i am aware that even you have written on the subject yourself uh, i already said that creation of opus means that india is no longer under stress to let quad move in a certain direction and take on certain roles that india would not like to take second when indian prime minister was in us uh, he openly complimented creation of aukus so underlining the fact that india sees aukus as complementary uh, to uh, doing a certain role that complements to what quad wants to do uh, so in that sense india it, it would also feel relieved of uh, any potential of being pushed to letting quad become an asian nato and those countries who want to create a security alliance uh, are happy to do that and they are former alliance partners of united states both uk and australia are alliance partners of united states so even they are not doing anything completely new of course this framework is new but the sentiment behind the it is not new their sentiment is to have military alliance with each other and i also want to underline too much focus on the nuclear naval uh, the nuclear submarine technology shifting to the uh, australia if you read what is actually going to happen in aukus there are lot more things that are going to happen un under aukus most of them are security centric approach of course but many other things many other initiatives many other technologies are going to be shifted also so it's perhaps media has put too much narrow focus on nuclear submarine technology moving and last point very quickly before i uh, allow others to uh, ask questions uh, is the fact that aukus announcement came as a kind of a surprise but we if you look at look back in history to operationalize those submarines uh, patrolling that region may take a decade or more it's not going to happen tomorrow even leasing could take a certain period of time and production definitely will take a decade so it's not something that is going to happen in in the immediate so idea here is to ensure that this is a messaging to china in that sense this is a this is symbolism in that sense involved here that these countries are willing to go that far and adopt those kind of uh, initiatives to ensure that there is a certain fair play that is ensured in, in that region and the, the fact that many of these uh, pacific island states are really vulnerable and that they are enormously you know, infrastructure deficit uh, hungry for infrastructure uh, can potentially be you know used by chinese to you know increase its leverages in some of these countries because then i never ask any question as to how you are running your domestic politics so some of these uh, countries island states i don't want to name them now uh, you are much familiar as to what kind of domestic politics in some of these uh, island states is running and they are therefore happy to engage in that economic investment coming from china and that potentially could impact their policies and the regional equations and alignments so in that sense here is a symbolism here is a message to china that uh, some of these countries could even go to the extent of uh, creating a fresh security alliance to uh, to kind of build up a response to china's uh, increasing foot let me stop here i i should give more time to other people's questions thank you so much professor and of course for highlighting the the practicality and reality of the opus and its implications in the long run uh, definitely thank you for that sir and the second question is how can india improve 
its strategic relations with South Asian countries amid China's rise? Uh, good question. Thank you, Don. I think that gives me an opportunity uh, to answer something which uh, sometimes uh, in media comes up in a very, very superficial manner. There is no doubt China's deep pockets, economic leverages have enhanced its influence uh, in all its periphery, including South Asia, which China treats as periphery, but is India's periphery immediately. So, yes, that does influence uh, their, the, the immediate neighbor's equations with India, because the size of India has always been a concern for these smaller neighbors. Uh, so other than Pakistan and Afghanistan, none of these neighbors share borders with each other, but they share borders with India. So you can understand, it's like a situation where some of them could even be paranoid of uh, being felt, be, be, being, you know, conceiving themselves as hostages. So small state syndrome, as we talk in international relations theory, has sometimes created those uh, anxieties. Sometimes they have also been misused because once you have democracy, you have elections, you have speeches, uh, it's uh, important for leaders to bring together a small country by saying, here is a big country and that country is bullying us, is there's a threat from that country. And that is an easy way to, you know, bring these small countries' populations behind one leader. And that, that has also been possible. Uh, the factor of partition I mentioned is another interesting thing which created a very special situation to how Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, uh, looked at India. So it's a complex history in that sense. And in the complex history, suddenly increasing, exponentially increasing uh, footprint of China does make uh, a certain concern in India, no doubt. But I want to now give the answer to what you said. What it means to India. All of India's neighbor, I dare say, on your platform, would prefer and have always indicated that they would prefer India to do those projects. If India can. But of course, India's pockets are not as deep as Chinese. India is not a one-party ruled country where uh, no questions are asked by uh, opposition leaders and media and others. It's one party. If, if it takes a decision, it follows that. So China has those advantages in that sense. So first thing, all of India's neighbors would prefer India to invest on the same projects if we can. But sometime when India is not able to, the Chinese come up and offer very, very attractive turnkey projects. And they have started creating debt traps. Father is leased for 43 years. Humban Dota is leased for 99 years. So these are big examples what is happening. So there are also a certain amount of discomfort in these countries as to how to deal with China. The opaqueness in decision making, high interest rates uh, on their investments. And I also dare say something else. The Chinese are going out and giving things that they are good at making. Not necessarily what recipient country actually needs. But if a big project is coming my way and I'm the national leader, I would like to see my plank and my name on the project. Let my grandchildren pay for it. And I can showcase that as my achievement for people for having created a big project. And that is a leverage for China. Now, the point is that gradually, after the initial excitement of engaging China and having the big projects, now these lease and inability to pay back, etc., etc., is also making these countries look back, step back, and try to understand what is happening to them. They understand today that China's relationship with them is driven purely, and I underline purely, by commercial interests and strategic interests increasing. India's relations with these neighbors, you go back to this history of this region, this is called Indian subcontinent, largely. You know, from Pakistan to almost Myanmar, including uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar. This is all one under British India and until 1937. Myanmar was also part of British India. Civilizationally, this is uh, all one region, one people. So look at all the borders of that India has. We have borders uh, with Sri Lanka where they, you have Tamils in Sri Lanka, you have Tamils in India. You have Punjabis in India, you have Punjabis in Pakistan, you have Bengalis in India, Bengalis in Bangladesh. So 
Madheshis in Bangladesh and plain people in India. So it's it's very interesting to see how the connect that India has with these neighbors. China can never even imagine, even imagine cannot replace that. These are geological connects, geographical connects, historical connects, civilizational connects, cultural connects, ethnic connects, linguistic connects, people to people connects, social connects. You know, these are very different kind of connection. And these countries have begun to gradually realize and India had started also showcasing that. So look at where Indian Prime Minister goes when he goes to Sri Lanka, when he goes to Nepal. He now goes to cultural sites, religious sites, because we share those with our neighbors. They are as much India's as much theirs in terms of cultural inheritance. So India is no doubt also investing in these countries, but that investment is not to compete and meet up with Chinese investments. That is a wrong frame to understand what is happening on the ground. India is investing, and India was investing right from 1950s. India's economic and technical cooperation program begins in 1957. And vision right from beginning was to enable local people to do things by themselves. So India was doing projects that will empower local populations, not enslave local populations. Look at the contrast here. And India's engagement continues to be that. And after initial lower attraction of big turnkey projects coming under my plank, my name being on that project, leaders and people have begun to gradually understand and balance that relationship over a period of time. Sorry, I became rather uh, vehement in answering this question and I took longer time to answer this question. Let me stop here and uh, I look forward to there are other questions. Thank you so much, Professor, for that elaborate response. Um, Regarding the third question, sir, uh, do you believe that the engagement of India with the BRICS group proves India's vision towards a cooperative, independent, and non-military approach? Uh, I, I agree with you, but that's uh, I would not put the entire credit on India's door for that. I think that's a global shift we notice. And sometimes I tell my students uh, that collapse of Soviet Union changed many things. And that was a gradual collapse. I go back to 1986, actually, the right rise of Gorbachev, the Estroika. When this constant competition, arms race for nuclear weapons begin to diminish, both physically and also in terms of its, you know, metaphoric significance in defining the world. And world started focusing on what was the world looking at 19th century or century which focused on welfare. Welfare was the focus of state. State was created for welfare. It is only 20th century that security overtook welfare. So the first function of state became security. So we are now returning back to welfare focus. So therefore I often say had Japan or Germany emerged as economic powerhouses in 21st century, when the understanding of power is different. Joseph Knight talks about diffusion of power, soft power. The very theoretical understanding of power has changed, comprehensive national strength. Now, Japan and Germany became economic powerhouses when economic power was not seen as an important component of power. Therefore, they never got the credit, and they were never seen as a big power. They continued to be seen as junior alliance partners of the United States, which had the most powerful military on the planet. Now, China's economic rise happens in a very different time zone, when economic component of power has become a very significant part of national power. And therefore, the world today recognizes China as a great power. But China is primarily an economic great power. It's not a military great power. So, because China's rise happens in a very different frame, in a very different time zone, uh, is why China is a great power. Now to the question you asked. So, I said, I don't want to give all the credit to India, is being the wise country to focusing on economic relationships. The whole global narratives are shifting. That comprehensive national strength puts enormous privilege on economic power, on development, 
In fact, security has taken development as part of it. Security itself. Security today is defined as not just protecting your borders, but also providing for your community at home. So we talk about food security, trade security, environment security, human security, and what not. It's not military security only. It's not just national security. So in that entire changed frame is where I I want to locate the fact that all of you know that Jim O'Neill wrote that paper in 2001, simply saying that G7 countries should invest in BRIC nations because they are rapidly developing. That is where per dollar returns are going to be better. He was an investor. He is looking at investment, and he sees that these four countries are the good ideal destinations for developed industrialized nations to go and invest so that they can draw more money. better per dollar returns so it begins with a fundamental assumption that if these two these four countries have something unique about them why not they come together perhaps they can bargain better as to what kind of investment and engagement will take place if they stand separate they may be having less bargaining power so let's come together and bargain together yardstick was simple that these are rapidly growing emerging economies they are opening up they are willing to engage outside investors and that brought them together so sometimes when you say oh this is not cohesive because their size is different their locations are far away their equations are problematic between china and india for example brazil is far away that's not that's not the glue that cements them together glue that cements cements them together is them being emerging economies and that is where india enthusiastically joined and continues to join they have of course added south africa later as a gateway to engage africa now a lot of people also question why south africa please read future projections in coming 50 years africa is going to be the apex center of both population growth and economic growth that should make you understand why china is investing so much in africa africa is where future is and south africa presented itself as gateway to that opportunity so south africa deservingly is part of brics in that sense even if it is a tiny 1/10th of the size of the chinese economy but it's important get to a future potential so brics has its role will continue to have its role yes pandemic has put enormous stress on their economies because all economies got disrupted and therefore because economic growth was the glue that combined them together it looks like there is a certain distinctions that are beginning to appear especially because one of the five nations called china claimed 2.3% growth during the same period when others were kind of seeing deceleration of enormous size so that this junction has also come about the fact that the whole world is angry with china because virus started in wuhan also perhaps impacts some of these countries so pandemic has had all kinds of impacts on brics uh, i would say another problem is brics has also expanded its agenda to include too many things they talk of terrorism and security and women empowerment and what not there is a limited mandate should stay in how to manage growth development investment trade etc etc that is the core defining area for them but they have started talking of many other things now of course you see they are going back the theme this year was consolidation so now brics are saying oh, go back go back please consolidate first don't just and spread out so thinly and become kind of not so effective uh, so brics is relevant because post pandemic resurgence or resilience of growth will meet again some of these countries very very attractive destination then they will come together and become again drivers of economic development most of them are talking of either v shape or u shape resilience in their economy and my last point on this once you have this boom coming back after enormous dip in in most of these economies that that will also be an opportunity to redefine your trajectories so if nations have been uncomfortable with certain kind of uh, whether it is supply chains production chains value chains you could perhaps tinker with those trajectories as you begin a fresh in many new areas startups are one great uh, new sector where i think lot of 
uh, potential lies in redefining those trajectories because tomorrow they will be the mainstream today they are outliers doing something brilliant of their own and they will come out with something fantastic and they will become mainstream tomorrow I mean, all main platforms that we are talking on today you know instagram or twitter or uh, whatsapp or facebook they were the outliers at some stage they are defining the way of life today for us so that is where i think there is a greater opportunity for these brics nations to focus on and that is greatly focused on uh, startups prime minister mentions them in almost every third speech that he gives on um, various uh, development related issues so brics i think can come together and they are focusing on consolidation and hopefully they will become uh, far more relevant and effective in coming times thank you so much professor and uh, perhaps you could get one last question um if that's fine sir um Perfect. while the while the india while india widened her ambitions in recent years especially through the act east ipoi and sagar do you feel the deepening of these projects remains a challenge what are the areas where india can deepen her engagements in the indo pacific i think there is no doubt uh, this whole indo pacific region is still in the making different countries as i uh, started my discussion today i said asean talks about an outlook and united states talks about a strategy in some you know for example britain talks about engagement so they have different metaphors which reflect uh, different perceptions of what they see the region that they are trying to engage chinese which are the most influential uh, country in the region is yet to issue a strategy for indo pacific or, or whatever paper white paper they want to uh, give on indo pacific region so there are variants of perceptions and that to me is a fundamental challenge for all the stakeholders including it so india is trying to launch certain initiatives you know push arguments in a certain direction because of this enormous variance the challenge would continue to be there it's not going to disappear even the centrality of asean is being questioned whether asean continues to be central because asean has become far too proximate to china so the fundamental principle of creating asean was that it will never ever under any circumstances hurt core interests of major powers and it never did that but now you see china was a country that was not seen as a major power when asean was created but has since become a major power and post east asian financial crisis the engagement of china with asean is very different so asean is seen as a friendlier to china is not taking on issues of artificial islands in south china sea so therefore asean perhaps is seen slightly redefining that understanding of not hurting the core interests of major powers because china is a major part today and by engaging china in this fashion asean begins to look like hurting interests of other major powers in that sense so would that mean that asean therefore would no longer sustain that centrality in the indo pacific region though all countries all stakeholders as of now in their speeches underline centrality of asean repeatedly but in actual practice you see that seems to be drifting away Why? because china was able to keep russia and united states out of east asian summits for full 10 years they joined only in 19 in 2015 so how can one country push asean centric initiative called east asian summits to ensure two big powers are not allowed to attend these or become members of this and these are issues that raise uh, some question marks on uh, the credibility of that centrality of asean though as a mantra as a refrain every speech says oh we want to endorse centrality of asean but in actual practice we notice that there are trends that begin to question that centrality of asean so in that sense that also will be a major challenge for india that if fundamentally the architecture both security and development architecture of this indo pacific region which was built around assumption of centrality of asean is drifting away from asean then what are the new axes which is evolving around which the new 
development and security architecture is going to be built. So if the goalposts are shifting, shall we say, to make it easier, then that presents a, a much deeper conceptual challenge to India as to the way it is engaging this larger region. Would that continue to be effective or would India have to kind of slightly redefine, re uh, you know, sort of uh, emphasize on certain things and de-emphasize on certain things? Yeah. Because India will stay on its course. India is not going to suddenly, as I said, bandwagon any other vision or any other country or any other strategy. But it can definitely do minor adjustments within that broad bandwidth of what defines India's engagement with the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. If that was the last question, I uh, must say I was greatly uh, delighted and uh, impressed by the very, very interesting questions that gave me more opportunity to speak more. And teachers, as all of you know, love to speak as much as they can. Yes. So you have to ultimately tell them, sir, you have gone beyond time by 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And this time people want to go home and have lunch. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you very much. I look forward to continuing with my engagement with this uh, uh, forum that you have. Global Forum for uh, study, Global Studies, Forum for Glo Global Studies. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Soren Singh. It was a true honor to have you here. And uh, on this note, I wish to give the floor to Dr. Sandeep for the closing remarks. Uh, Dr. Sandeep? Can I make a request, Don? If yes, I sir. can request our participants to switch on their videos and they can see who are people with us. Oh, yes, yes. Take a picture. A group okay, picture. Uh, you. Could we please request uh, all the participants to switch on uh, your cameras? Yeah, so uh, dear participants, uh, this is my request to you. Uh, please open your video so that uh, one picture we could. Yeah, we have uh, two of them with us. Yes, yes, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. I can see that. And others, seen. those who are here, uh, this is my request. Once, yes. please. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so I think if people have decided that this is how many people want to come with us, I will then switch on my, I am now going to click my picture. Thank you. So sir. I will say one, two, and three, and uh, please, uh, you can just smile. So let's say one, two, and uh, three. Thank you. I have taken the picture for myself. Thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you, professor. Thank so you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, Professor uh, Sean Singh. Uh, this, uh, as in my initial, uh, no, uh, welcome note, uh, I had, uh, you know, stated that uh, uh, Professor Singh's lecture is going to be very, very delightful, and uh, literally, uh, the way, uh, sir, you uh, covered all the areas regarding Indo-Pacific, and especially uh, Don's questions. Uh, uh, Don's question is not like uh, you know a media's question, and you mentioned also it's a very depth question. And some some of the very insightful question like uh, India's uh, you know uh, India's uh, India's engagement India's engagement in Indo-Pacific is because of the Chinese pushing factor and the way you responded that uh, India's uh, drive in the uh, Indo-Pacific is not all about the Chinese pushing factor it's, it has its own reservation and uh, uh, being a civilization, uh, being a, it has all the specific relation with its neighboring countries like Myanmar, Sri Lanka, you mentioned especially Nepal. So we have its own strategic autonomy. And so though your response on this question is very, very delightful. And the second question like BRICS, uh, and, and, and I'm very privileged to have uh, Professor Casio Jin here from the BRICS Brazil country. And I, of course, I hope that this question was posed by him. And the way, sir, you articulated this question that uh, a big should confine only very coherent agendas and we should hit the agenda. And uh, uh, and uh, you, uh, sir, your response in the South Africa, generally the international community is just look upon only the big powers. They don't they don't think about you know, like uh, South Hemisphere. And the way I use the response in the South Africa is going to be gateway of development. And um, and uh, the the way uh, India, Brazil, and South Africa and Russia, of course, so we can contain you know in South power to China through this bridge. So thank you for so your response on the brick question and your response in, in the recent evolving of the AUKUS. 
that you responded that India's uh, India's stand on the Indo-Pacific is not militarized and is something uh, which is uh, no, its own specific and we are not going to make it an NATO nation, NATO Asian, and we are not going to you know, uncomfort to our time trusted partner Russia. That's it's not Asian partner. So literally, sir, this session was uh, highly insightful, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm so honored, and uh, I, I feel and I'm looking forward to your lecture in the future for this forum. So I hope that uh, in the future your uh, no, articulate voice on India's foreign policy will be getting for us. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Sol Singh. Thank you so much, Don McLean, for your nice moderator, as you always did. And thank you so much, today's host, Professor Cassiogen, as the finest twice from the Southern Hemisphere, from the South-South Cooperation. He's not, he's something, he's always saying that, let us redefine the international uh, discourse of politics by involving you know, South-South uh, Cooperation. So thank you so much, Kaishojan, and thank you so much all the participants, those who have uh, here, those who have joined us, and uh, thank you so much. Good luck. Have a good day.